I am Brother Stephen Elabo, welcoming you to the Life Bible Church, Charlottesville, United States, a place where the undiluted Word of God is being preached. You are about to listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, as a comfort to share the mind of God with you and your family. I want you to be ready to pick up your pen and your paper and jot down important messages as they will do you good. God bless you and remain blessed. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can see that we're looking at Luke chapter 14. As you know, we're preparing for our December retreat at this time. In many years now, we've been having Easter retreat and December retreat. And this time now, we're preparing for the December retreat. And if you've been there before, you know that God always gives us great, great blessings. And this December retreat, starting actually this week, Thursday, the 24th of this month, December, until the 27th, is going to be a great, great retreat. It's going to be a unique retreat. And the Lord is going to grant us a great breakthrough and a pouring of His Spirit and of His power and of His provision in Jesus' name. If you've been coming before, you are coming again. I said you are coming again. And then when you come there, you see what the Lord is doing. You'll say, I never saw anything like this before because it's going to be wonderful. And those who have not been coming before, this will be your first time. It's going to be an unforgettable encounter, unforgettable experience with the Lord in Jesus' name. Now we're going to look at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 16. Then said he to him, a certain man made a great supper, and he bade many. The Lord Jesus Christ was responding to the outburst proclamation or statement that somebody had made. Actually, the Lord Jesus Christ was having supper in a particular place. Let's look at this from verse 1. And it came to pass, as they went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat dinner, and uh, to eat bread, rather, on the Sabbath day, they watched that they watched him. They wanted to see what he will do. To start with here, we need to learn a lot from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. He's the cornerstone of the church. He's the very foundation of the church. I told you before that there are people that, the way they understand their Bible, they become more serious than Jesus, more righteous than Jesus, more sanctimonious than Jesus, and they think that they know more than Jesus Christ ever knew. And they bring all these traditions and all these laws, and they say, if you're a Christian, if you're born again, this is what you do, and this is not what you do. And they go beyond the scriptures. Look at this, for example, it says, it came to pass. As he went into the house of one, of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. Do you know that the Pharisees actually as a religious body, as the denominations, they need to believe the truth. They need to understand the truth. They didn't know about salvation. They did not even know about being born again. They didn't know anything spiritual. And yet the chief Pharisee here invited Jesus Christ to come and eat bread. And Jesus will make use of every opportunity to pass across the message. Because all those Pharisees, even though they were not born again, they were creatures of God. And he made them all. He came into this world and he came to his own. And his own knew him not. His own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave them power to become the sons and the children of God. By the way, many of us, if we're invited to the house of a sinner just to come and eat bread, we say, no, we don't do that. We are born again. I will think we know more than Jesus Christ. It was at that time when Jesus Christ was there eating bread with this chief Pharisee that something came up. I'm looking at it now from verse 14. And Jesus Christ made use of that opportunity to teach the people, to instruct the people. Every chance we have in our lives, every opportunity we have in our lives, we should use it to fulfill the great commission. 
whether you are with a denomination that do not believe in the Bible, a denomination that is not born again, a Pharisee that does not know about spiritual things, you use simply opportunity to emphasize the ways of the kingdom, the watch of the kingdom, the will of the king. And here is what Jesus Christ was doing at this time. Would you look at it in verse 12? Then said he also to him, that bade him, that is now he's talking to the chief Pharisee, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also be thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. Jesus used that situation, that bread they were taking, that supper they were taking, that food they were eating, and he went from that to teaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus is a perfect example. He wants us to take every situation we find in life, whether with a believer, with a non-believer, with a Pharisee, with a Sadducee, with a religious fanatic, or with any other person, use that individual situation and preach the gospel unto them in verse 13. But when thou makest a peace, Call the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Another thing we learn over here is that the Lord Jesus Christ did not look at those people, whether they will believe the resurrection of the just or not. He just told them the truth. That's why he said, for this purpose am I come that I might give witness to the truth. And whether with Pharisee or Sadducee denomination or ministry or whatever it is, he was giving witness to the truth every time. In verse 15, when one of them that sat at meat was him, heard these sayings, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus now said, Then he said unto him, you understand then the context and the background of what Jesus Christ was talking about. He was eating in the house of that chief Pharisee. And somebody said, wouldn't it be wonderful, blessed, wonderfully blessed, that will eat in the kingdom of God. And this fellow that said that did not know about the kingdom, was not born again. And therefore Jesus now wanted to emphasize what it means to be in the kingdom. And then you are invited to the kingdom, you repent of your sin, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a member of the body of Christ, a real child of God. But if you reject and give excuse, then you'll be excluded from the kingdom. Let's look at it from verse 17 now. And sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidding, come for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. What was Jesus talking about? It was in the house of a Pharisee. And the Pharisees rejected him. And they rejected the king of the kingdom. They rejected the kingdom. They rejected salvation. And was going to show them the tragedy, the peril, the danger, and the damnation of rejecting the kingdom of God. And so he now gave them a parable. And the parable was interpreting to mean that the kingdom came to the Jews. Salvation came to the Jews. And what Jesus Christ brought came to the Jews. But he rejected it. And it is that rejection was talking about now. And then he said, it's going to go to all the people because the people that ought to accept had rejected. Look at it now in verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excuse. Now, the excuse here was not tenable, was not witchy enough, because before you buy the land, you examine it, you know the dimension, you know what you are buying before you ever buy. But he said, I bought the land already, and I want to go and see it. And then he said, excuse me, I will not be able to come. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them to try them. I pray thee, have me excuse. Before you buy yoke of oxen, you're going to try them. Will they work? Are they strong enough? Are they healthy? Are they sick? And are they experienced? Are they new? Are they whatever? You're going to find out. But he said, I've just bought this. 
and I want to go and check up on them. Another one said, look at it in verse 20. It says, another one said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. What an excuse that is, but the Bible says, the word of God says, let him that is married be as though he wasn't married. That you will not allow marriage or bearing children or family responsibilities to take away the kingdom of God away from you. Because except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And getting married should not interrupt and should not hinder getting to the kingdom of God or receiving the invitation that the king of kings is giving unto you or giving to any of us. And so that servant came and showed this Lord these things then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the, of the city and bring him hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Here Jesus Christ was telling this Pharisee, You see, Pharisee, you're missing a great opportunity. You're missing a great chance, the greatest chance of your life. The kingdom of God has come. And the king of the kingdom has come. Salvation has come. Righteousness has come. And all of heaven has come unto you. And you are rejecting because of religion. You are rejecting because of your tradition. And God is going to replace you in the kingdom. What a lesson we're learning here that when God calls you to something, an opportunity, a privilege, a ministry, a commission, and into the kingdom. And then you have one excuse or the other to have your own way. You reject it, the Lord will excuse you, but he's going to replace you. It doesn't mean that the kingdom will not come just because you are rejecting it. It doesn't mean that salvation will not be given to other people just because you are rejecting it. What they rejected, the Lord gave unto other people. And so he sent the servant, as he said, go to the highways and the streets and the corners of the city and tell all those people, the men and the blind and the lame and everybody, the impotent, and bring them in so that everything that has been provided will now be given unto all these. And they were told in verse 22, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The servant came back to report. You see, when you're giving something to do, you must come back and report, this is what has been done. And you must be able to say, this is done, and this is still the privilege of the opportunity that is still available. And then we're told that the Lord said in verse, in verse 23, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Look at verse 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidding shall taste of my supper. The Lord was uh, telling this chief Pharisee that all you Pharisees rejecting the kingdom of God and rejecting the word of God and rejecting the salvation of the Lord as you reject and give excuse, you will not taste of the supper. You will not taste of the kingdom of God, of the benefits of the kingdom of God because you have rejected other people are going to come in. Let me show you the interpretation of this in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 45. Acts chapter 13, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and they speak against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Here we find them, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish people, the religious, hard-hearted people, the callous people, and the people that will not accept the salvation that Jesus brought, the righteousness that Jesus brought, the redemption that Jesus brought, the good things of the kingdom and of the king that Jesus Christ brought, they will not accept. And when they saw other people accepting other people, joining in other people, flowing in, then they began to contradict and blaspheme. And then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. It was necessary. You, descendants of Abraham, and you Jewish people, and you people of the covenant, the Lord said, He'll send the Messiah, the Christ, unto you, and He'll be your Savior and your shepherd. It was right that the gospel should have first come unto you. But then He said, But seeing ye put it from you, 
and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, return to the Gentiles. That's the meaning of the parable. When those Jewish people, religious people, denominations, when they rejected the word of salvation, now go to the hedges of the highways and go to all those places and the people that do not have any denomination umbrella over them, any denominational control over them, any tradition of the elders over them, go and call them and they will come in. Verse 27, for so as the Lord commanded us saying, I have said thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for the salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believe. I pray you'll believe in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. But we're going to apply this. It's applicable to salvation. It's applicable to sanctification. It's applicable to the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon us. And it's applicable to going for the retreat that the Lord is preparing. A great peace and a great supper and great blessings for everyone. And he says all things are ready. And he wants us to talk about that. And so we're going to make the application of the word of God in the right way. It's a, the passage of the scripture we're looking at was not written just for retreat. It's reaching for us to be able to get the benefits of heaven upon our lives. And we're going to make a well-rounded, scriptural, balanced application of the word of God. All things are now ready. Everybody, can you say that with me? All things are now ready. Can you say that again? Once more. All things are now ready. The Lord was telling the people actually that now salvation is ready. Telling them healing is ready. Telling them deliverance is ready. Telling them the power of the Holy Ghost is ready. Telling them everything they ever wished for. Everything they ever prayed for. Everything they ever wanted from the old covenant. That everything is now ready. They were looking for that the Messiah will come. And that when Messiah comes, there will be peace. There will be prosperity. There will be joy. There will be victory. There will be dominion. There will be triumph. Everything they were asking for. That when the Messiah comes, the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth. As the waters cover the ocean. Everything, knowledge and blessing and gifts, everything was now ready and the announcement was made unto them come in and you can have everything available unto you and we're going for the retreat and we're making announcement and proclamation everywhere and we're telling them whatever your need may be whatever the challenge of your life may be and whatever it is your desires are so that your joy will be full for yourself for your wife, for your husband, for your children for your relatives, for neighbors and for your co-workers, everything is now ready I pray you'll be a partaker of that in Jesus' name. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, provision of sufficient supplies by God. The provision of sufficient supplies by God. Number two, the proclamation by the servants of God. The proclamation, the publicity, the promotion, the blessing it abroad, and they're talking about it, that everything is now ready, that if you are a child of God, if you are a servant of the Lord, you will take the message as well, and you will tell everybody, wherever you find any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, and you will tell them the word of the Lord, everything, all things are now ready. And as you tell them, I believe they will come. I said they will come. You will come and they will come. You will participate and the blessings of the Lord will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Point number three, participation of saints and sinners in the great gathering. Participation of saints and sinners in the great gathering. Number one, the provision of sufficient supplies by God. Let's come back to this Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, we're looking at verse 16 and verse 17. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. That's what bade means, he invited many. He wanted many people to come. In verse 17, and he sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidding, come for all things are now what? Ready. I want you to notice that is very important. It says, Come, all things are now ready. 
You know, as you look at the religious world of today, it doesn't matter what the religious world is, whether it's traditional religion or whether it's historic religion, whether it is evangelical religion, whether it is Pentecostal religion, whether it is charismatic religion. You know, the problem we have in many churches today, they say, come. Everybody says, come. Everybody says, come. They say, come. Come, come. Because healing is ready. And that's where they stop. Come. Because deliverance is ready. That's why they stop. They don't, they don't emphasize salvation. They don't emphasize restitution. They don't emphasize righteousness. They don't emphasize sanctification, holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. They don't emphasize the second coming of the Lord. They don't emphasize the blessing we have in the family, one man, one wife, without uh, any part, any separation until death do us part. You just say, come, only healing. Come, only deliverance. Or some is prosperity. Come, prosperity is available. But the Lord said, don't just say that. Don't limit the blessings of the kingdom. Give the whole package and tell everybody, everything is now available. And that is the uniqueness of Deeper Life Bible Church. That's the uniqueness of this our church here. We don't give a one-sided gospel. We don't give just a limited gospel. We say everything from salvation to redemption to healing to deliverance to sanctification to holiness to everything you can think about the power to stand and the power to live a victorious life everything is now ready come all things are now ready and as we prepare for this coming retreat we're telling the people that whatever the need of your life may be and whatever the challenge of your life may be that now you can come if you're a sinner, you can come, you'll have salvation. If you're a backslider, you can come, you'll have restoration. If you're a believer, you can come, you'll have holiness and sanctification. If you're weak, you can come, you have the strength of the Lord and the power of the Lord. If you're a sorrowful believer, sad believer, dejected believer, depressed believer, you can come and you have the victory over your depression in Jesus' name. And if you have any need in your life, you can come. All your needs are going to be supplied because the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, the Master, sage, the Son, Servant out and he said, Come because all things are now ready. And uh, we're appealing to all the preachers, not only the preachers in Deeper Life, preachers everywhere. Anyone that is uh, studying the word of God with us, don't only preach, don't only preach salvation, don't only preach healing, don't only preach deliverance, preach everything and all the provision of Calvary, everything that the death of Christ has made available, and tell the people, come for all things are now ready. Let me show you what the word of God says about all things being ready. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. It says in verse 3, Blessed be the, Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How could you miss that? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Salvation, that's part of it. Sanctification, that's part of it. Righteousness, that's part of it. Redemption, that's part of it. Healing, that's part of it. Deliverance, that's part of it. Triumphant victory over temptation every day, every moment, that's part of it. The joy of the Lord, oh, that's part of it. Because Jesus Christ said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's why he says over here that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I pray that your blessing will not be limited. Your blessings will not be limited if your desires are not limited, if your aspirations are not limited, if your understanding of Calvary is not limited, and if your desires, what you want in the church, why you are remaining in the church, why you come to the church, if that desire is not limited, if it's as broad as the provision of Calvary, if your desires are as broad as the promises coming from Christ, if your desires are as broad as what the blood of Jesus has made available, then your expectation, which is your manifestation, will not be limited in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 8, I'm looking at verse 32. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 32. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also? Tell me the next word. Tell me again. Freely give us what? all things. 
brothers and sisters, I want you to look up here. You know, and sometimes it's very hard for you to stay in the very center of the will of God, the very center of the word and the teaching and the doctrine of the Bible. When you see many people around you doing this and doing this and doing that, and you think that, you know, of course they're doing this and they're doing that. And since the majority of people are doing that, you can be swayed up. Look at what it says over there, what I just read to you now. I want to emphasize that again. All things, all things, all things. He that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, not outside him, with him, also freely give us all things. Once again, don't limit those all things. Don't limit Calvary. Don't limit Christ. Don't limit the provision that Jesus Christ made. Salvation is there. Forgiveness is there. Victory is there. Sanctification is there. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord is there. A victorious life day after day, month after month, and year after year. It's there. And the joy of the Lord for you to live above the waters and live a kind of a life that is triumphant, victorious. It's there. All things and the power of the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. All things. Everything there. And the power to be able to accomplish everything the Lord has called you to accomplish. That's what's available. And that's where what's, we have retreats. Other people also have maybe convention or congress or conference or whatever. We call it, we call it retreat. Whatever name you call it, we make all things available. You'll get those all things in Jesus' name. But you know what? There's some places where they say, as we're coming to the retreat, you must fast for 21 days before you come. We don't say that. Fast for seven days before you come. We don't say that. Or fast for this number of hours before you come. And during that treaty, you don't eat anything. Just stay there. And if you really want to have this and have this and have this, you must do it by the works of fasting. But you know, you know what it says here? Is it by fasting that we get all these things? Tell me out loud. How do we get them? How do we get them? Let me read that verse again, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, what? Freely give us all things free. I said it's free. I said it's free. Other people say it depends on sowing the seed, bringing money, much money. And so at the time, they have all those gatherings together in the morning, offering in the afternoon, offering in the evening, offering every time, offering. And the more offering you give and the more money you give and the more seed you sow, the more you'll be able to get the healing, even though the seed they're providing is even so limited. And yet you have to pay much money, much money, much money, freely give us all things. What Calvary has provided is free. And you're going to have them in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're reading it from verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us, how many things? Wonderful, wonderful. He has given unto us all things. How could you ever be weak? How could you ever be falling into sin, falling and rising, falling and rising? How could you ever be a captive of the devil, a slave of the devil, when the Lord has provided everything from Calvary, from salvation to healing to power to sanctification to holiness to readiness to the, for the second coming? He has provided everything according to his divine power. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and things that pertain unto godliness. All things in the spiritual side, all things in the social side, all things in the physical side, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of what? 
of the divine nature, partakers of divine nature. See what Calvary has provided. He has even provided divine nature, the nature of God entering into us that will give us a victory over every work of the devil. And then he says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws, we're going to escape. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 32 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. For after all these things, do the Gentiles seek. What's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about food and clothing and shelter. And he says, after all these things, do the Gentiles seek. How many people do you know today? That's all they're looking for. If they pray, that's all they're looking for. Protection from enemy, protection from the climate. Protection from this, protection from that, the shelter, the clothing, and the food. Maybe some money, and the money is still to buy food and shelter, clothing, and just all that. And Jesus said, this is the limit of what the Gentiles are looking for. And you must go beyond the Gentiles. You must go beyond the pagans. You must go beyond the idol worshippers. You must go beyond the sinners. And do not allow your, you know, all that you are seeking for. You are just seeking for material things and clothing and shelter and marriage and children. Just that. That's too limited. He's giving us all things. And because he's giving us all things, we're going to get all those things. That's why he says, for your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of all these things. Then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you know that people don't put that first today? They don't put salvation first today. They don't put repentance, turning away from sin, turning away from idolatry, turning away from adultery, turning away from fornication, turning away from evil, turning away from stealing, turning away from cheating. They don't put that first today. They don't put holiness, sanctification, righteousness. They don't put that first. But Jesus said, the Lord is going to give us all things, but we must reorder our priority and make this the number one. Seek it first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he said, and all these things shall be added unto you. Praise the Lord. He will add all those things. Because he said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. He will give you. Seek, and ye shall find. You will find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. How many people will have their prayers answered during the retreat? Everyone, everyone, you included, praise the Lord. Everyone that acteth receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son has bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he then been evil, how to know how to give good things to your children. How much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? He'll give us good things. But told in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Matthew chapter 21, we're looking at verse 22. And all things, those are the words again, not just some things. Not just a few things, not limited blessing. Everything that you need, physical, spiritual, social, for your profession, for your family, in every area of your life, but make the spiritual things come first. And all things, verse 22, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You are coming to the retreat and you are going to receive in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. Point number two, proclamation by the servants of God. Proclamation by the servants of God. We're coming back to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 14, verse 17. And uh, now here is uh, where we know those who are real committed disciples of Christ. Here is where we know those who are real children of God. I, I want to remind you that we're not the only people reading the Bible in this country, in this continent of Africa. Many other people read the Bible too, but they read, but they don't obey. They don't do. It doesn't touch their lives. We're not the only people that go for, 
you know, gathering together, this great, great gatherings, other people do too. But the word of God they hear, they don't carry out. But here is where we know those who are real children of God. Thank God I'm a real child of God. Are you a real child of God? The way we know a real child of God is when we hear the word of God and we tremble at that word. And we believe that word. And we trust that word. And we carry out that word. And we live according to that word. And if we're living according to the word of God, there should be somebody there like Enoch. If we're living according to the word of God, we're learning. There should be somebody there like Joseph. If we're living according to the word of God, we're learning. There'll be somebody there that the, that the neighbors are pointing. It looks like Daniel. If we're reading the word of God, obeying the word of God, we'll be looking like where Paul, where, where, you know, Stephen. We'll be like people that are really following the Lord because we obey and we carry out the word of God that we learn. But, you know, if we're all there and we just read the Bible and, you know, nobody resembles. Enoch, Elijah, Elisha, and nobody resembles David or Joseph or Paul or Peter. What kind of study will that be? The reason why we study the Word of God is that it will touch our lives and turn us around and change us. And somebody will say, I see the glory of God upon you because I see the obedience of the Word of God in your life. And you are better yet today than yesterday, brighter today than yesterday, and higher today than yesterday, and more obedient today than yesterday. I pray that that glory and that evidence of obedience to the Word of God will be upon our lives in Jesus name. And somebody there will be like Enoch. I said somebody will be like Daniel. Somebody there will be like Joseph. And then somebody will be like Peter and John. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And when you go out of the study and the action of your life and the things that you do as you become one of the children of God and one of the servants of God and you're carrying out everything that you have learned, somebody will take knowledge of you that he must have been at the Bible study because there is a change, there is a turning around, the transformation in his life. I pray to happen to us in Jesus' name. Be ye doers of the word and not hear us only. Now in Luke chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 17. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidding, come for all things are now ready. He, he sent them. And as he sent them, he said, go tell them all things are now ready. Look at verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. This was, this was an obedient servant. And I pray you'll be an obedient servant. To hear it and to do it. To read it and to do it. To learn it and to do it. And to study it and to carry it out. That is the beauty of studying the Bible. We're not studying the Bible for exam after all. We're not studying for work after all. We're not studying it for, you know, just writing an exam. We're studying so we can practice it. So that as we do it, we carry it out. It will have a real mark evidence in our lives that we're real children of God. And so he went out and did what the Lord had told him to do. And then he came back to report back to the Lord. I have done what you have said I should do. But this is the response and the attitude of the people. And then the Lord said, go quickly. Go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the cities and bring in hither the poor, the maim, and, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done. Think about that. It is done. Think about that. You know, sometimes this is not the first time we're talking about proclaiming it and publicizing it and publishing it. Have you done it? Have you told your neighbors? The handbills you have got, did you send it out? And the word of salvation, testimony, it wants you to give to other people. Have you given that? Because he said, do it. And then this servant came back, the disciple came back and he said, it is done. According as to what you have commanded, and yet there is room. I pray that we'll be obedient to the word in Jesus' name. We're looking at Matthew chapter 22, obedience to the word as a servant as a disciple, as somebody the Lord has given the word to you, that you know the word of salvation, preach that word of salvation to other people. You know, in the earlier years and days, our ministry, Deeper Christian Life Ministry, you know what we used to do? In the bus, we'll rise up and we'll talk about salvation. 
I tell you, the passage is talking about, go and tell them the word of salvation. And at the, you know, in the bus, we say, this is the word of salvation. At the train station, in the taxi, in the classroom, in everywhere we went on the street, we told the people the word of the Lord. Because that's what he said, go and do, go and tell them and invite them, invite them to Christ. And tell them salvation is available. And tell them that all the blessings that Calvary has provided, everyone can now come and receive. And today, how many of us are doing that? How many of us are sitting down with strangers and with neighbors and with, you know, people and neighbors that we never they have not been talking to? And now we're talking to them. We're saying, my friend, do you know there's something called salvation? Jesus came into this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And if you'll turn away from your sin and receive him as a personal savior, he will save you. How many people are doing that today? The Lord wants us to do it. And from this day, you rise up and do it. In Matthew chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 22, verse 8. Then said he to his servants, all his servants. You, you see that in the plural. It's not just the servants that are, you know, old or the servants that are young or the servants that, you know, are very, very active or the servants we call workers. It's everyone, everyone that names the name of Christ. Everyone that says, I'm a child of God. I listen to the word of God and I take Jesus Christ as my savior, as my Lord, as my master, as my director. And he tells me what to do and I do it. Everyone, he tells all the servants. This is what he tells them in verse 8. He says, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidding are not, were not worthy. Go ye therefore. You hear that? Go ye therefore. He's telling us, go and tell them the provision that the Heavenly Father has made. Go and tell them the salvation that is now available, the forgiveness that is now available, the transformation of life that is now available. Go and tell them, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. They left every other thing and they put the first things first. And then they exalted and esteemed the work of the Lord as number one. Those servants, they left every other thing and they went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. As these ones obeyed the Lord, so the Lord is challenging us to that we are going to obey him we're going to obey him in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, we're looking at verse 16. It says, Behold, I sent you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. But that's not the excuse. And your sheep and they are wolves and they might be abusive or destructive or murderous or whatever. That's not an excuse. It says, I'm still sending you out and we go out to them. Those uh, difficult uh, neighbors, offensive neighbors, hard-hearted neighbors, everyone, the men and the women, the uncooperative, uncooperative neighbors, everyone, I'm sending you out to them. The young people, I'm sending you to them. You know, those young people today, they might be here or there. They might act this way or act that other way. Just go to them and tell them of the salvation that Jesus Christ has given us. And you tell them also about the retreat that is coming, that when they come, the Lord will turn their lives around. I said they will turn their lives around. And they will never be the same again in Jesus' name. The Lord can take anybody, any life, no matter how bad they are, vile, they are how disobedient, they are how sinful they are. And he can turn their lives around and they will never be the same again. That's why the Lord is saying that you are a child in the kingdom, a sheep in the fold. And I'm sending you out in the midst of those wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Don't fight them. Don't abuse them. Don't retaliate. Be as simple and as harmless as those. And the wise and the Lord will help every one of us in Jesus' name. In John chapter 10, verse 16. John chapter 10. We're looking at verse 16. It says, And all the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. 
the Lord is saying that he's sending us out because many people are still out there. They're not born again yet. They do not know the Lord yet, and the Lord is saved. I want them to be saved. I died for them. I shed my blood for them. And many people that are roaming the streets in this city and in many cities of our country, the Lord is sending you out as a child of God. I tell them something good is waiting for them at the retreat. And tell them of the goodness of the Lord, of the grace of God, of the uh, abundance of the Lord that the Lord is providing. And then you can even pray with them there and get them saved. You can even pray with them there and get them healed. And after that salvation, after that healing, and after the blessing of God coming upon them, as you pray with them, even before the retreat, then you bring them to the retreat and many, many more things they need the Lord will provide in their lives in Jesus' name. Remember what the Lord has said, all the sheep I have, I have them, I know them. I want them to come in, all the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. I see going to bring them by you telling them, by you inviting them, by you preaching to them, by you influencing them, and by you drawing them into the kingdom. It says, them I must bring. They shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and there shall be one shepherd. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22. We're looking at verse 17. The Lord expects us to be obedient to his word. When he gives a commandment, he wants us to obey. When he says, this is what to do, he wants that done. That's what shows that you're a disciple. That's what shows that you're a child of God. That's what shows that you're a follower of the Lord. If there's no obedience to the word of God, how do we show that we are children of God? I pray you'll obey in Jesus' name. And as we're preparing for this retreat, having just a few days more, today is Monday, and we're starting on what day now? Today is 21st, and we're starting when? 24. And it will continue till 27. And at all these days, you make sure you reserve them for this retreat. And then your brother, your sister, your neighbor, everyone, you are saying, are you ready? Are you getting ready? Because God is ready. All things are now ready. And we're going to have the blessings of the Lord. And then with excitement and joy, enthusiasm, we're all rushing there, running there. And great will be our blessings in Jesus' name. Now in the Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hear us say, come. If you have heard about it, if you have known about it, tell other people to tell them, come. You can tell them by word of mouth. You can tell them through the telephone. You can tell them by sending a text. You can, we can tell them over the radio. We can tell them over the television. We can tell them through the newspapers. We can tell them through the various medias available. The point is we're telling them effectively, come, come, and they will come. And let him that has such come, even if nobody is inviting, that is, you have not been invited by anybody, but you are hearing. Already you know where it is, you know when it is, and the Lord is saying, if you are thirsty and you want the provision that Calvary has made available, all things, whatever it is you need, physical or spiritual, and also the assurance of getting to heaven when you die. The Lord is saying, whosoever is thirsty, whosoever is desirous, whosoever is having the passion, the desire for the blessings of God coming upon your life, let him come. And then he says, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life with fasting. With sowing his seed, with giving large amount of money, how? Freely. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because you, I don't know whether you've heard this before. When good people keep quiet, evil thrives. Evil will increase. Evil will gain ground when good people who know the truth never voice out the truth. When people are emphasizing money and this and that. And that's not the emphasis of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is going the wrong direction. If the people who know the teaching of Christ and the doctrine of the Bible, if they're quiet and they allow the wrong doctrine to just be emphasized, emphasized, then all that is going to gain ground and destroy the real center of Christianity. That's why we're emphasizing what the Lord has emphasized, that he paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary. And now he says, and whosoever will, let him come and take that water of life freely. 
and as you come, the Lord will make it available. Salvation available. Victory over sin available. Healing available. Deliverance available. And strength for the weak available. And all the blessings of Calvary available for everyone in Jesus' name. We come to point number three, participation of saints and sinners in the great gathering. Participation of saints and sinners in the great gathering. We're looking at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And I'm reading now from verse 18. Luke chapter 14, looking at verse 18. And they all with one consent, with one accord, as if they had seen one another with agreement, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. I told you already that actually Jesus Christ was directing this at the religious people, at the Jews. And he said, these people, salvation has come to them. He's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to spiritual blessing. And they're making excuses. And they're saying, I've got this material thing. I cannot come. Have me excused. Is that not the reason why some people are not at the Bible study? They know about the Bible study. And they know the riches they're going to have at the Bible study. But they say, I'm going through extramural studies. I cannot come. Please excuse me. I'm on a particular journey, and I'm, you know, having this, and excuse me, I cannot come. I'm doing overtime, excuse me, I cannot come. I'm uh, looking at this particular project and this particular company, excuse me, I cannot come. God is not going to give you salvation if you don't seek salvation because your business is keeping you away from seeking salvation. Or maybe it is your business keeping you away from getting strong in the Lord. You're not just going to get strong in the Lord without asking, without praying. Other people, it's like, you know, it is another thing. This one says, I've got this five yoke of oxen. I want to go and try them. I've got these uh, people I just employed. I want to see their ability and their productivity. Excuse me, I cannot come. Is this not the reason why some people are not coming to the retreat? Our family is having extended family meeting. And this is the only time when we can have that meeting. Excuse me, I cannot come. Or I'm taking some exams at this particular period. I'm sorry, I cannot come. Or this is the only time I can go for holidays overseas with my family. And because of that, I cannot come. All those excuse makers, they're going to be excused out of the kingdom of God. I pray that will not happen to you in Jesus' name. But you know, the people that really want to serve the Lord, they don't give any excuse. And this other one said, in verse 20, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Marriage should be a blessing. It becomes a hindrance to some people. You know, some people who have gotten married and because of marriage, I'm sorry, I cannot do evangelism. You know, I just got married. I'm sorry, I cannot go and preach. I just got married. I'm sorry, I cannot have that commitment, consecration. I've just gotten married. Don't allow these good things to hinder you from getting to the kingdom of God. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? Marriage, children, money, land, employment, and all those things. Hindering people from the kingdom of God. I pray you will not be hindered. I said I pray you will not be hindered. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. Some people, it is their position that hinders them. They say, well, I know that a deeper life retreat is really going to be a spiritual retreat and God is going to really turn people around. And if I could be there, I know what God will do. But you know, the, the environment in that place and, you know, where we have a location. How can I be there? They're thinking of the physical convenience or inconvenience. I'm telling you that hell will be more inconvenient than any retreat location. And why don't you endure whatever it is you have to endure so you can get to heaven and escape the damnation and the punishment and the pain of hell and just say whatever happens, my position, my personality, I'm going to be there and then you'll be there and God will bless you in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 verse 25. And as a reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled 
an answer, go thy way. This time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He never called. He never called. He's now in hellfire. Think about that. That You know, there are people that say, I know it is true. I know this is the right thing to do. I know how to be there. But I have some other things I'm thinking about now that is not convenient for me now. And when I have convenient season, I will send for you. He never sent. Again, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Excuse makers. The people that make excuses, and because of those excuses, they aren't able to get to the kingdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which had the force began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Here the Lord is saying, how shall we escape the judgment of God if we refuse the salvation of the Lord? That's what the Lord is saying. We should not give any excuse that you hearing my voice and hearing this teaching from the word of God today, from the words of Jesus Christ, you will not give any excuse. You'll be at this retreat. I said you'll be at this retreat. And then you influence all the people under your control, under your influence, to be at the retreat as well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 25. See that she refuse not him that speaketh. The servants of the Lord are going out and they're inviting us. And they're telling us, this is the word of the Lord. The servants of the Lord are preaching the word of salvation and the word of restitution and the word of righteousness and the word of sanctification and holiness and the word that will prepare us for heaven. The servants of God are telling us what it takes to be able to get ready, not just getting ready for the retreat, getting ready for the rapture, getting ready for heaven. See that she refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not to refuse him that speak on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. I pray we will not reject the word of God in Jesus' name. I come back to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm reading there from verse 21. Luke chapter 14. We're looking at verse 21. Look at this. So the servant came and showed his love these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, had said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets. Notice that into the streets. And the lanes, notice that the lanes of the city, and bring in either the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servants, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be what? Filled. I want you to notice the serious thing that the Lord Jesus was saying. The Bible says he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave... You are listening to our pastor, Pastor W. F. Kumoye, or other anointed minister of God from our ministry. Let the words sink in your heart and they will do you good throughout your whole life. It is our belief by the grace of the Lord that you will come and worship with us at Deeper Life Bible Church, number 4656 Bravo Drive. We have our service every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 11.30. And we have our Bible study on every Monday. From 7 to 8.30. As you are doing so, I, the grace of the Lord will continue to be with you and you will never be the same. Thank you. God bless you.